things you work with. And uh, it's incredible the amount of energy and time and dedication that he puts in. He's an open minded and honest uh, person, a great fan command. I have a list of accomplishments here that will take 10 minutes to read, but I'm not going to read it there. But they go on and on. Uh, he's, a, he's a man, he, his company is a real estate development company, CW Management, that focuses on parks and green space and uh, uh, improving the quality of life and improving development. And the president talent, I am honored to introduce the Honorable Wayne Niederhauser. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Thank you for not boring people with a uh, laundry list of uh, uh, profile. I'm uh, grateful to be with you today to talk a little bit about uh, the state legislature. I uh, was grateful for Rhoda Ramsey's comment about President Kennedy. I can't believe that's been 50 years ago. And not to necessarily reveal my age, but I was just barely four years old when President Kennedy died. And I remember that. As a four-year-old, I don't remember much, but it was very significant to me. It was very emotional for me to, to have uh, the President of the United States assass assassinated. Um, I just remember that being very significant. Uh, I lived in Tremont, Utah. At the time, my dad worked for Mountain Fuel Supply Company, now Questar. And um, I'm going to tell you just a little story. And you, if you've heard this, uh, um, you'll be bored with this, I guess. Uh, in second grade, I call it, are you smarter than a second grader? I, uh, from a very early age, was very adept at the financial type of Things. My mom worked for Bear River State Bank, I'm a CPA, I see Mary Kay here, I worked for Mary Kay for a short period of time, and uh, I had hesitated to mention this uh, story, um, but uh, she worked for Bear River State Bank and she'd bring home counter checks, and she taught me how to write out a check as a second grader. And we loved, uh, as kids, filling out checks and, and buying things with each other, and uh, the commerce that created. And we didn't completely understand what a check was, but I'll tell you after this experience, uh, I knew what, how the banking system worked. Well, my dad, I had a fascination with money. And I would, uh, whenever I'd get an allowance, the coin, I'd look at the coins, look at the dates, I was wondering what this symbol meant. And, and this is as a seven year old. And um, on, on the back of a $5 bill, I noticed that there was the Lincoln Memorial. And in the, if you look really close, you could see Lincoln in there. And what are the numbers? Who was signing it? The Secretary of the Treasury. And so it cost $5 for a lunch pass at North Park Elementary School in Tremont. And uh, periodically, I'd go to my dad who uh, would be sitting down in the living room at night, or in the TV, call the TV room, and ask him for $5 because I would need to buy my lunch pass. I was getting low on uh, my little 20 uh, lunch pass that I'd get from the principal. So one night, uh, he get, I went down, Dad, I need $5. He gave me this $5 bill. I'm walking down the hall thinking, this is such a... I didn't want to spend it. I just wanted to keep it. In fact, for weird, I, I loved saving. And I had this little passbook. Remember the passbooks? And you'd go in and they would update the interest and everything on your on your savings account. And I remember probably having about uh, maybe forty dollars, but my goal was a hundred dollars. Uh, but I didn't. I didn't necessarily want to put the five dollars in the bank. I just wanted to have it to look at, it, to, to hold it, to possess that five dollars. Once in a while, Dad would pull out a hundred dollar bill and it just blow my mind. Um, but on the way back to my bedroom to go to bed that night, I had an epiphany. 
I'll write out a check for my lunch pass. <laughs> so I went in and pulled out from the uh, underneath my bed this little box that had the counter checks. I wrote down North Park Elementary School, and a, you should see a picture of it with this guy. And, uh, and I knew how to write it out, $5, 5 and $100. And then I signed Mary Beth Niederhauser. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Didn't know what forgery was either at that time. <laughs> but I did learn uh, what forgery was <laughs> through this process. So, um, and I had this, I love airplanes. We'd just been to California visiting my aunt and found the Sacramento Airport. They bought me this United airplane. I just loved it. And so for the check number, I put TWA 1000. <laughs> <laughs> I knew something was wrong. The shoulder devil and the shoulder angel were having their heyday with me as I walked to school the three blocks from my house. In one pocket was the $5 bill. And the other pocket was the $5 check. And I struggled with this, Clint, <laughs> all the way to school. And this is before the principals, you know, there was a lot of staff in, in a in school. The principal pretty much did everything. I stood in the line, there was Principal Hawks, was his name. And I stood in line there, and the whole time I'm thinking, okay, $5, give me the check. It's finally my turn, and I pull out the check, give him the check. He looks at the check, pulls out the stamp, stamps it, and uh, puts it in his drawer, gives me the, the uh, card. Wow. I love the financial system. <laughs> that night I took that $5 home, and I put it in my little drawer where I keep uh, my, my passbook and those, those precious things that were... Uh, Fascinating to me, and for a few days, uh, I'd pull that out and look at that $5 bill. And it was, it was almost a week before the rep, before the, the, uh, the, door, uh, the door opened or the door closed. Um, uh, amazing the amount of float <laughs> in those days. Um, and I get a phone call from my mom when I get home from school. Wayne, do you have five dollars? How did she know? <laughs> well, the bookkeeper, the, the she was a teller at the River State Bank, and Kurt Webb, if you know Representative Webb, his dad was the president of the bank, and uh, my mom worked for him. And the bookkeeper had come up to my mom that morning and said, "Mary Beth." Someone has forged your name. And she looks at the check and she thought, goodness. Um, so I learned that day that you have to, uh, that writing out a check isn't enough. You have to cover that check. And I learned, uh, I, I'm probably the only second grader in the world that understood it in a, in a very deep way how, the, how a check worked and how the input system worked. Um, so the five dollars is gone, and all the counter checks are gone too. <laughs> that, that was the end of that uh, lesson. Um, but I just want to give that story as a little precursor, and then I think I'd like to just open up to questions. Um, but I think the biggest issue that is facing our state and our nation is the finances of the federal government. We are now $17 trillion in debt. Now, as a percentage of GDP, I think we've been there before, but not in the same fashion. We're paying off a war debt in World War II. There may have been some war debt we had in the Civil War. We have ongoing liabilities like we've never had before as a federal government, uh, and that is uh, with the entitlement program. And it's not so much Social Security as it is the many health care uh, programs that are out there. And, and Washington seems to be paralyzed and, and not doing anything proactively. In fact, 
we're coming up, we were talking about uh, well, what's going to happen. I was asked, what's going to happen with the debt ceilings next month? Well, I think we can all predict that. They'll run it right up to the very end, and financial markets will start to go down, and they might even go past it a couple of days, and finally they'll do something. And I hate that kind of management. Um, and we do that to some degree in the Utah legislature, but for the most part, we try and get ahead of the problems. And I wish that we could see a lot of that happening with uh, the federal government. But there's this question out there about jurisdictional line. Where do the states stop and end in their jurisdiction? Where is the federal government stopping? The founders, which, by the way, were neither Republican or Democrat, as we know that name. They may have been a Whig, or I think there was a Democratic Party, but it was a completely different Democratic Party. Their platform would have been uh, extremely different. I, I think mostly the, the constitutional uh, founders were either Federalists or Anti-Federalists. And had Anti-Federalists prevailed, you know, we probably wouldn't be a, a nation. The states were too powerful. But I submit to you that the federal government was becoming too powerful. And the founders wanted to curb that, so they created the three branches of government, the checks and balances. But then they also created the states. Or the, well, the states were already created, but they created a balance there. And they said in the Tenth Amendment, and actually in about the first two sentences of the Constitution, there's some implication that um, if it isn't specifically mentioned in here, it is reserved for the states and the people. And I'm going to just uh, give you a quote, and then Think about who this might come from. You'll be surprised at him. Congress has been given the right to legislate on particular subjects, but this is not the case in the matter of a great number of vital problems of government, such as the conduct of public utilities, of banks, of insurance, of business, of agriculture, of education, of social welfare, and of a dozen other important features. In these, Washington must not be encouraged to interfere. Local government is the best government. The best type is right at City Hall. That is a quote by Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt, March 2nd, 1930. Um, he obviously changed his tune um, not long after that. Um, but there was supposed to be this natural conflict, and we all, uh, I think in the public, generally hate the conflict. The conflict is good. It keeps bad, bad things from happening. And, the, and I'm concerned about the concentration of power we're allowing to have take place in Washington, D.C. Concentration of power, historically, has been controlling it's power, which ends up in corruption, and a threat to our rights. And I'm blaming the states for a lot of this. I won't read the quotes, but I've got a number of quotes here that I could give you of a number of the founders in their discussion in creating this country and the Constitution which governs it. Um, they said the states have to be a check and a what the states have succumbed to over the years is the money. We're letting the feds control us because of the money. Here's a program. Here are all the features of it. You can't go to the right or to the left. It's a one size fits all. And uh, but here's the money. The states have accepted the money, and we have an issue before us right now, uh, and that's Medicaid expansion. I can tell you right now that Utah will not be the first to expand Medicaid. In fact, I was on the Health Care Reform Task Force, and I discovered there that if we had some flexibility just with our current Medicaid program, that we could cover the expansion population with 
with Medicaid expansion, and they would just let the states want to grant us the money. We can only spend it on Medicaid. But let us be creative. There's ways that we can take that same block of money and insure more people. But uh, there's a lot of self-interest in Washington, D.C. And then a lot of those things, they won't allow us to, to deal with. But um, we won't be the first, but I almost I can guarantee you we probably won't be the last either. As the red states start to cave in to the money, uh, Utah, my prediction is no cave in. I see that as the biggest issue facing Utah and our nation. Some of the other topics that uh, we'll face as the legislature over some time here in the next few, in the near future, education. And a big part of that is education funding. Um, Senator Pat Jones has a bill that will do away with the credit for exemptions, raise $400 million for education. There is the idea that maybe we would push higher ed back into the general fund and free up more money out of the education fund for public education. Because we don't want to raise the income tax rate. Our businesses, uh, that's, that's a productivity, um, anti-productivity tax. And already the feds uh, have taken all the head from out of that. Uh, in the world, we are now some of the highest uh, taxes, we have some of the highest taxes in this country on income tax. So uh, I think that the legislature will resist completely the increase in the rate. Uh, but there is some um, debate to be had on how we're going to uh, deal with the funding challenges that we have for education. Our unfunded liabilities in uh, transportation, we keep building roads, but now we don't have the money to maintain them. We haven't raised the gas tax for many years. And I'm not necessarily advocating any policy here. I'm just saying these are the, these are the discussions that, are being take, that, are being take, that will take place. And you, as citizens and as business leaders, need to be weighing in on this and welcome your, your input. Um, so if we move higher ed back into the, into the general fund, there will probably be an increase in uh, sales tax. Or maybe we'll push transportation more out of the general fund into the transportation fund. So it's an increase in, in gas tax. The most hated tax is property tax in Utah. Uh, but the second most hated tax by uh, uh, by a poll, it's not income tax; it's gas tax. And and then we also have to determine what the gas tax is in Idaho, Nevada, and some of these others, because that plays into the whole effect of what we do. Uh, but these are the kind of issues that we'll be dealing with, I believe, over the next couple of years. And uh, and I hope that you'll weigh in on. Them. Um, immigration is pretty much uh, a non-issue right now in Utah. We did our thing a couple of years ago, and now we're uh, waiting for the feds to, to respond. Uh, we kind of backed off of it or, or because of on the threat that they would uh, preempt us on immigration reform. Uh, there's the topic of air quality, and uh, again, uh, education is a big issue. Uh, I also just briefly want to say that I just spent uh, a week, the first part of September in China. I was in Dendong on the border of North Korea and um, saw a stark difference in two communist countries. One gray, no life, no happiness. Uh, and devastation as far as any kind of development is concerned. The other, vibrant, people are happy, they're singing on the streets, they're dancing, they're, they're doing Tai Chi, they're hack, doing a hacky sack. I got into a, a circle with uh, some ladies about 70 years old. They were uh, using their back foot and their side foot, and, and they, they didn't miss. And their eyes hit it and go, <laughs> Somewhere, you know, long, short or long, and, uh, but uh, the Chinese people are very vibrant. They're free. They come and go as they please, uh, pretty much. I think some of their speech 
obviously is probably um, restricted, so they don't have necessarily all the freedoms that we have. But I see them as a people. Uh, I met with a lot of government officials. Without fail, they said, we want peace. We won't shoot unless we're shoot, but shot upon. And uh, I think the biggest problem that the United States has with China is that we fear each other too much. Hopefully, some of this dialogue will help. Uh, and Americans need to face that the Chinese will be the largest uh, economy in the world. It's going to happen. They have 1.3 billion people. They'll never, uh, probably, it's inconceivable that they never match our GDP per person. But they will have a large. We need to, as a nation, reach out to that country, develop some really strong relationships, so that, uh, because they're in a they're in a mode of war, and they admitted to me, government officials, that they have problems, and they're looking for solutions, they're not finding the solutions. And that kind of uh, need that they have can create, I think, some relationship, uh, and and we can learn from them. The amount of regulation is very minimal. Uh, and that may be to the detriment of things like pollution. <laughs> and so forth. Beijing was pretty, uh, pretty polluted and never cleared up on any day. Um, but they admit that they have some problems. They're, uh, I think they're looking to have some collaboration, uh, but are, are fearful of us and how we respond. And I hope that uh, we'll reach out and create a, a friendship because Friendship would be a lot better than uh, having an enemy in China. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? Schools uh, all just got grades based on the legislative mandate. As you know, it's very controversial. Grades seem to be part of these two related to demographics. I'm wondering what the legislature had in mind in mandating such a so the question is school grading. Um, there, this has been controversial. Um, I've been right in the middle of that issue, and I can tell you that uh, we did a Utah-style school grading uh, that had, came from Florida. Florida has been doing this for 15 years, and you can look at study. People can produce. Uh, studies that will show that it wasn't effective. People can produce studies that will show that it is effective. But the things that happen in Florida uh, are amazing. It looked at the bottom part of this, the transparency. This is called transparency. It's, it's all based on student outcomes. And if you had some time, I could go into a lot of detail, but we don't. But I can just tell you that the intent of the legislature is not to um, give a black eye or the scarlet letter to any school. What we wanted this clarity. And let me just tell you what are some of the results of that already. We've discovered that there are a number of Title I schools in inner city Ogden and Salt Lake City that got Bs. What are they doing different than an F school? In fact, several of those have demographics where they have over 90%, well, the one had 80% English language learners. They have 90% on free and reduced lunch. Um, very challenged school with its population, but they got to be. So in our task force this week, we're bringing those successes to try and discover what it is they're doing that other schools aren't doing. Uh, the legislature has taken on this effort along with the governor to try and deal with education going forward. And uh, we've got some big challenges. We've got kids graduating from high school. If they graduate, we're finding out that the graduation level is significantly less than we thought. Uh, you've got West High School that uh, you know has had a lot of accolades because they have the IB program there, uh, but yet their graduation rate is is way down the chart. 
and the proficiency rates, especially among Hispanics, are, are, uh, are very, very low. And this kind of clarity is drawing attention to those issues. That's what happened in Florida. And they've been able to bring up their NAEP score. It's not necessarily among the high proficient students, but among those that were not proficient. Now, this is not the end. Um, um, this is just the beginning. Now, we need to rally around as business leaders, as parents, as grandparents. We now need to rally around these schools and, and lift their lift these populations and give them the education that uh, will make them productive citizens, will keep them out of jail. Uh, this is the workforce of our future. It's the minority majority. And, and we're headed that way. Florida is you know, 30, 40 years ahead of us in that issue. And they realized this many years ago, making steps. And, and Florida did this without a lot of increase in, in, in revenue for, for schools. And there are obviously a lot of they fund a lot more than we, and we're right at the bottom of the barrel. So we have some extra challenges, but we need to face this now that we have the clarity to do something about it. So thanks. That's your job, Ben, right? Former superintendent of the Southern School District. I, who has, uh, yes, sir. Do you see the legislature making any changes to the mission or procedures of the School Institutional Trust Lands Administration? Um, I think that we're. Yeah, uh, the, the question is, are we going to deal with CITLA, the school trust, uh, or our trust lands? Um, what are we going to do with that? I don't know. Uh, there was this question with regards to uh, Anadarko and wanting to do that contract down there. Their purpose is to maximize the returns for our kids. Now, maybe they are not seeing the forest for the trees with this. Uh, I haven't gotten into all the details personally on that. We have a number of senators who understand the issue better than I do. Uh, but there needs to be, uh, they need to be ones removed from the legislature. We don't want us controlling a lot of what goes on there and having them more independent. But with that independence comes the challenges of accountability. So. Uh, that's that's a good question. I don't know how that will be addressed, but uh, we're hoping for some ideas to bring the balance of good accountability and uh, autonomy uh, with that purpose of maximizing the return for our, our schools and our kids. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you about the Medicaid expansion. Okay. Uh, Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Uh, it's not easy to qualify for Medicaid. Uh, you have to be you have to be more than just poor. You have to be a mother with dependent children or be disabled. So, if the state decides not to expand Medicaid, what would the legislature? What would you advocate the legislature do to get these people covered? Well, I can just uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's uh, whole uh, the whole health care issue is a big issue. The reason why I say that we won't expand Medicaid is because um, the main reason is the federal government is $17 trillion in debt. And they're implementing new programs and appropriating more money. Yes, for a good cause, healthcare. But when are they going to stop? When are they going to have some physical responsibility and balance the budget? They haven't even had a budget for four years, five years. How do you file? That's just incomprehensible to me as a CPA. And we finally now have the CPAs involved. With Financial Ready Utah, we passed some, uh, some resolution. We've got CPAs now raising the red flag saying, this is unsustainable. This is going to be a detriment to our country. So that's the discussion here and this whole issue of jurisdictional line and the states continuing to take the money because it's just concentrated power and corruption and everything that comes with that in one location centralizing government. So Utah was headed down the road of federal uh, of health care reform. We were one of the first with a 
an exchange, the Small Business Exchange. We were working on an individual exchange when the ACA was passed. It completely put a wrench in the spokes of everything that we were trying to do for a long time to try to address the very question you're addressing because it's a great question and needs some answers. I agree with that completely. We were already headed down that on a state initiative and, and were tripped up by ACA and since that passage our health care health system reform committee has just been doing defense the whole time. How do we respond to this? And, and what are we going to do with how are we going to react to the feds on this? And what, it's this whole discussion. And so uh, I just wish they would have avoided that because the states, given some time, they do come up with solutions. We were already headed down that. Speaker uh, Clark and many others were the leaders in that. And, and I uh, I uh, reflect what uh, President Waters and Speaker Clark did just a couple years ago. They wrote a letter to Congress that said, why grant us the money? We'll cover the expansion population. Just give us some flexibility with the program. And I believe that could happen. We do those kind of things here in Utah. We have, we have that, uh, it's, a, it's a culture, it's a mentality. And, and we make do, we are uh, very creative with, those, with many of those issues that come up. In fact, wherever I'm at in legislative circles across the country, you guys passed a law about this. How did you do that? You know, that's very intriguing. That's a great solution to that. It's, you know, that's what we get. And, and it isn't that we're special as legislators, it's because we're special as, a, as Utahns. And it's, I think it's just ingrained in what we do. So you, you ask a great question. Um, I think there's some better answers, but right now we're just faced with what the federal solution is. Appreciate uh, your time, Senator, and your, your talking to us. Um, he's uh, made a nice note in our book for Franklin Elementary. We'll be uh, passing this book along, uh, Civil War. Um, next week, we'll be at the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. Okay? So we'll have a place over there. And uh, so we'd love to have all of you be there for this uh, discussion and, and vote on the.